but we are excited this morning. Um, we want to make sure we get this uh, to you clearly this morning because this is important as all scripture is. Uh, it's really important that we understand this. And so um, I want to make sure everybody gets this uh, clearly. We're going to be reading from 1 Corinthians uh, the 12th chapter and the 14th chapter this morning. But we want you to write that down so that you can read on it on your own because there's a little, there's more than what I talk about here on when we talk about tongues this morning. So we want to get you a clear understanding on the, 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 the word this morning. So I'm going to give you some of the information and I need you to go in on your own and read the rest of the information. Can I get an amen on that amen. this morning? Amen. Amen. So we are talking about tongues 101. And so um, a lot of you have heard the, the word tongues before. Some of you may have never heard the word tongues before. But the word tongue um, in the scripture, in the Greek text, it, it literally means language. It means language. And so um, last week we spoke on Genesis 11, uh, 7 through 8, where the Tower of Babel, we talked about the Tower of Babel where uh, the universe, they, they had a universal language, but it was separated by God because they, because of the sin in these people's lives. They were trying to build a tower to, to God and trying to do things on their own and without the, the help of God. And so uh, God separated the languages at that moment. Uh, because of their rebellion against him. And so he confused the languages. That's why you see so many different languages in this world. Um, and so he, he did that so that they would not understand each other because of the, the sin and the, the, the rebellion that they had towards God. And so um, in the book of Acts is when the Lord restored that language. He restored the, them being able to communicate to all different types of people. And so the, through the work of what Jesus did, uh, God restored the ability to talk to all people about God and, and, re and reveal the word to everybody. So in the book of Acts, the Lord sent his promised Holy Spirit at what we call Pentecost. The word Pentecost means 50. And so um, the Lord, uh, after the Lord promised the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the Lord left. And when the Lord left to be with the Father after 50 days, he sent back the promised Holy Spirit. That's why it's called Pentecost. And so... Um, he provided the Holy Spirit, and when he provided the Holy Spirit, the first gift that he gave the, the men of God was the gift of tongues, the gift of tongues, and that was the gift of understanding and, or speaking in a language that they had not learned. And so the, the tongues is a gift, and I want you to write this down. Tongues is a gift which, which the Spirit, meaning the Holy Spirit, provides, which is an ability to speak in a language that you do not know. Now, here's the key part that a lot of people miss out on. In order to minister to the person who speaks that language. So if I go in, if I have the gift of speaking in tongues and I go to somebody who speaks Spanish and I'm under the unction of the Holy Spirit and I'm teaching them or trying to show them who Jesus Christ is or show them the, the, the praise of God, uh, when I do that, because I'm under the unction of the Holy Spirit, I can understand and speak that person's language uh, when I haven't even learned it. So that is the, what the gift of tongues is. And so, um, so to understand that is huge. And so since the Spirit of the Lord provides spiritual gifts, which is what the Spirit of the Lord does, the Holy Spirit provides gifts, you have to know this. The enemy tempts the believer to abuse the privileges. Whatever gift you're given, the enemy will tempt you to abuse that privilege. If you're given the gift of knowledge, he'll, he'll give you the temptation to use the knowledge that he had for the kingdom of God for the purpose of the world. You see? So, so the, the, the enemy normally will tempt people to or believers to abuse the privilege or the gift that God has given you. If you have the gift to encourage, because that's a gift, that a spiritual gift that the Lord provides for you. Now, the purpose of encouraging people is to encourage people to come to the Lord, encourage people to come to church, and encourage people to read their Bibles, to do things like that. Now, if you have that gift and you're not using it for the Lord, you may use it for the world and encourage women or encourage men or encourage relationships and all the other stuff instead of using your encouragement for the Lord. So the enemy always will use and tempt you to use the gift that he that the Lord provides for you for the purpose that is none other than the church. And so naturally, God gives you. Uh, if God gives you the gift of tongues, which is speaking in, in, uh, in other languages that you have not learned, the enemy wants to use, wants you to use it at times when it does nothing for God. 
And so that's the key to understanding this. The in, because we're talking about the gifts of tongues, the enemy would want you to use those tongues at the wrong time or think you're speaking at tongues uh, and use those uh, that speaking at the wrong time. And so uh, why is that? Because it glorifies the believer. You see? So anytime you use a gift that God has given you for the wrong purpose, it glorifies you and not God. So that's what he wants to do with tongues. He, he taught these, I mean, he allowed these people to understand and, and, and talk in tongues, but he wanted to, you know, the enemy wanted them to use it at the wrong time. And so the Satan attempt was to cause confusion with these new gifts that God has just provided. Remember, at Pentecost, God had given, the Holy Spirit had opened up and the Holy Spirit was giving gifts. And that, that the, the gift that the Spirit was given, the enemy came behind that and was trying to get them to use those gifts at the wrong time. Because it's new gifts. If you have something new, you, you, you may use it premature, uh, prematurely, use it at the wrong time. And that's what they were doing with these gifts. And so since the Corinthian church had consistent abuse of gifts, this is why the Apostle Paul wrote books like the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians to correct them and to give directions on how the gifts were to function in the church. It's so important that the gifts function correctly. So if God gives you a gift, you have to know how to use that gift in the church. And so that's why Paul gave that, that understanding to the people so that they could understand what their gifts were about and how to use their gifts. And so um, tongues was the particular gift that he spoke about extensively in Corinthians. Why is that? Because it's an important gift, an important gift to understand. Because if it's used properly, it edifies and glorifies God. But if it's used improperly, like we said before, it edifies self. Mm -hmm. And so our purpose today is to make sure you understand tongues. It's tongues 101. That's the name of the service. And the reason for that is because we need you to understand what, what, what tongues is and if it still applies today and if people are using it correctly. Can I get an amen this amen. morning? Amen. So Paul gives direction specifically on tongues, and he summarizes this whole chapter 14. He summarizes this whole thing by saying in chapter 14, 39 through 40, I don't, you don't have to go there, just write that down, 39 through 40, he specifically summarizes it by saying, you know, and, and, and I'm just generalizing this, he says, therefore be eager to prophesy and do not forbid speaking in tongues, but everything should be done in Order. That's what he says. In order. So if you're going to use a gift that God has given you, you have to be in order when you use that gift. And so the, the, the key that the enemy will bring in is out of order. So if something seems out of order or is brought out of order, it was not ordained of God. But if it's in order and done according to how Paul addresses it and Paul gives directions on it, then it's of God. So the spiritual gifts, now the one thing you have to understand, since the spiritual gifts are the same today as they were then, you have to understand that the, 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 the corrections to the usage that applied then applies now also. They have the same gifts then that they have now. And so if, God, if, if Paul gave instructions on how to do things then, then they fast forward to now because it's the same gifts. And so you have to you, you utilize what Paul says about these gifts. Now, we established, the first thing we established last week is that the that, that tongues that were spoken were real languages. Yeah, yeah. So I want you to write that down. Tongues that were spoken were real languages. The reason I need you to write that down is because um, they're, they're, they're actual languages. They're people, you know, if somebody speaks a different language in here for me to speak in that tongue, that means I speak in their language even though I was not, I had not learned that language at all. So the first thing we established is that tongues were spoken real languages. Now Paul gives a breakdown of the different gifts and we want to talk about that in 1 Corinthians 12. 1 Corinthians 12, 7 through 10. I want to give you that. 1 Corinthians 12, 7 through 10. This is what he says. He says, now to each one, the manifestation of the spirit is given for one common good. You hear that? For one common good. He says, to one there is given through the Spirit, a message of wisdom. That's what we talked about. Mm -hmm. To another, a message of knowledge. By means of the same Spirit, to another, faith. And so faith is a gift that God gives. By the same Spirit, to another, gifts of healing. 
by that one spirit to another miraculous powers, to another prophecy, to another distinguishing between spirits, meaning discerning spirits. You can tell when somebody's of God and somebody's not of God by the spirit that you can feel through the Holy Spirit. So to another speaking in different kinds of tongues and still to another interpretation of tongues. All these are at work at the work of one and the same spirit and he distributes them to each one just as he determines. I want you to underline or write that down on your paper, just as he determines. It's the spirit that determines that. And so a couple of things I wanted to, 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 to under, you to understand here. Um, all of these gifts were for the movement of the church. All of these gifts were for the movement of the church. So if you read eight again, it says to one, he is give, he is, uh, there is given, through the spirit, a message of wisdom uh, for the church. To another, he gives a message of knowledge, everybody, for the church. For to, the church. By, to, by the same means of the spirit, to another, faith for the church. By the same means, another, a gift of healing for the church. By another, miraculous powers for the church, prophecy for the church, distinguishing between spirits for the church, speaking in different languages for the church, interpreting other languages for the church, for the movement of the gospel, for the purpose of God. So, so understanding that is huge because the, the, the couple things that are important that I need you to jot down here, verse 7 and 8 identifies that it is the spirit that gives the gifts, not man. You get that? It's the spirit that gives the gift, not man. And, 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 and verse 11 says the same thing. And he distributes them to each one just as he determines. The spirit determines, not man. Now, so if the spirit gives for the common good as he sees fit, then to assume that all must have a specific gift like tongues, is not scripturally correct. You get that? So if the spirit gives a common good, you know, gives the, 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 the gifts for his own purpose, for his own reasoning, according to what God has supplied him with, then to assume that all must have a specific gift is not scripturally correct. Now I say that for a reason, but I want to give you this number two here. The second thing is the fact that he says this, he says to one, and then he says to another, and then he says to another, and then he says to this person, to that person, to this person. What does that identify? That helps you to understand that not all gifts are given to the same person. And if not all gifts are given to the same person, or one person may have one gift, and one person might have another gift. Now, it's not me who says that. It's the word that says that. To one, I may give you wisdom. To, to, to this person, I may give you knowledge. I may give you healing. I may give you restoration. I may give you all this stuff. But he gives each person according to the plans that he has for the church. You know what that means? It means that each person doesn't have the same gift. We all have different gifts. Now, it's important that you understand that because some churches insist that you must have the gift of tongues as evidence of the Holy Spirit. Yes, that's true. You see? See, but the word says different. Mm -hmm. And so I'm not here to tell you what I feel. I'm here to tell you what I know. The scripture says different, and so anybody who tells you that, and I'm talking to all people, even the people who hear maybe by the internet, any church that tells you that, you have the right to question why they say that. Mm -hmm. Because your word says different. That's right. So some churches say you have to have that gift as evidence of the Holy Spirit, and so they, they try to force you to speak in what they call tongues, unknown languages, but that is not correct according to what we just read here in scripture. And so Paul confirms that if the, if the language is not intelligible, <laughs> it's useless for the church. You hear that? If the language is not intelligible, it's useless for the church. And we're gonna read that in 14. We're going to 14 now. Uh, chapter 14, we're going to verse six. Chapter 14, verse six through 14. Now this is Paul saying that. This is not me saying that. So you can't say my pastor did it. You can say the word said this. And so you have the right to, uh, to ask people about what the word says. And so this is what the word says. It says, now brothers and sisters, if I come to you and speak in tongues, which is other languages, 
what good will I be to you unless I bring you some revelation or knowledge or prophecy or word of instruction? Even in the case of lifeless things that make sounds, he's giving examples here, such as a pipe or a harp, how will you know what tune is being play, played unless there is a, distinguished, a distinction in the notes? Again, if the trumpet does not sound a clear call, who will get ready for battle? So it is with you. Unless you speak intelligible words with your tongue, how will anyone know what you are saying? Remember, this is Paul saying this. Mm -hmm. Then he says, you will just be speaking into the air. <laughs> Undoubtedly, there are all sorts of languages in the world, yet none of them is without meaning. Did you hear that? Mm -hmm. None of them is without meaning. And then he says, if then I do not grasp the meaning of what I, someone is saying, I am a foreigner to the speaker, and the speaker is a foreigner to me. Mm -hmm. So it is with you. Since you are eager for gifts of the Spirit, try to excel in those that build up the church. Wow. This is Paul. This is not Larry. This is Paul saying that. He's saying if you're going to do something, do something that benefits the church, not something for yourself. That's right. This is Paul saying that. What else did he say? Now, um, he says also, verse 13, for this reason. Now he gives direction. The one who speaks in a tongue should pray that they may interpret what they say. Mm -hmm. why, do you, why would you speak in an unknown language and not know what you're saying? Exactly. And so he says, for those who speak in a tongue, they should interpret what they, uh, pray that they interpret what they say. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. I need you to understand what it's talking about when it says unfruitful here. It's talking about because the language is unlearned, you never learned it, you're only speaking it according to what the Spirit has given you, your mind is unfruitful. Why? Because you didn't even know what you were saying. Mm -hmm. You didn't learn it. There's no history on it. Your mind is unfruitful. And so the language being spoken is from the Spirit, it's not from the mind. The gift that you get is from the Spirit, not from you. So if that's the case, it says, so the mind, uh, so what shall I do? I will pray with my spirit, but I will also pray with my understanding. He says, I will sing with my spirit, but I will also sing with my understanding. Now, Paul confirms there are more valuable words, um, more value in words spoken and understood than a lot of words spoken uh, that were unfruitful, that were not of your language. And he does this in verse 19. I want to read verse 19 to you. Verse 19, he says this. But in the church, I would rather speak five intelligible words to instruct other than 10,000 words in a tongue. Can I get an amen this morning? Amen. You hear that? This is Paul that says that. Paul says, look, it's great that you can speak in other languages, but if the person who you're, if the person who you need to speak to who speaks in that language is not there, then all that word is, uh, that you're speaking is gibberish. It does nothing for the congregation. Right. So then Paul establishes that uh, tongues were needed for believers, but not non-believers. I mean, were not needed for believers, but needed for non-believers. Now, we want to read verse 22, and I'm skimming through this because I need you to understand some things here. Uh, verse 22, he says, tongues then are a sign, not for believers, but for unbelievers. Prophecy, however, is not for unbelievers, but for believers. And then, um, so, so, so why is that? Why is there a key here? Because believers did not need a sign for God, from God. They already had a sign from God. Mm -hmm. That's the reason you believe, because you had a sign from God. You, you had faith. That's because God has given you that faith. You had a, a, a understanding and God helped you through a situation. That's because you understood. Now you understand that he exists. And so, so Paul, so he's saying that believers did not need a sign from God. Non-believers did. And so now what he's also saying, tongues is not the sign that non-believers need. Why? Because let's put it this way. 
If you came into this church and it was your first time coming here and you walked into the church and everybody was speaking in an unknown language that you did not know about, you've never heard, they're shouting and screaming and saying all these things, gibberish and ever all kind of things, talking in another language, speaking in different types of quote unquote tongues and everybody's doing it except you, how would you feel? You feel isolated. You'd be like, man, I can't do what they're doing. You feel just like the people of Acts felt. They felt when they heard these people speaking in tongues, they said, man, these people must be drunk. There must be something wrong. That's exactly what they said. They must be have had too much wine. They must be on this other thing. They must be going in the wrong door. I don't know what's wrong with these people. So I can tell you how I felt when I walked into a church and I heard everybody speaking in tongues. I knew that I wasn't going to do that. I knew I couldn't do that. I knew I didn't know how to do that, do what they were doing. So I felt isolated when I went there. And so I'm telling you, this is not what I experienced. I'm telling you what Paul says about this. Paul then says that it's for, un, I mean, it's for unbelievers, but this is what he says in 23 and 24. He says, so if the whole church comes together and everyone speaks in tongues and inquires or unbelievers come in, will they not say that you are out of your mind? This is Paul saying it. It has nothing to do with how I feel when I went there, it has everything to do with what the Word of God says. Yeah. Paul is saying 2,000 years ago, I felt the same way that you feel, Larry, if when you go to church, if you see everybody speaking in an unknown language, and it's your first time trying to be identified by God. He says, they will not say to you, or will they not say to you that you are out of your mind? And then it says, but if an unbeliever or an inquirer comes to you while everyone is prophesying, they are convinced or convicted of sin and are brought under judgment by all. See, if you come into this church and it's your first time here and you come here and everybody's speaking in tongues, you'll say, I can't do that. But if you come into the church and somebody prophesies and say, hey, sir, I want to tell you that whatever you're dealing with, God is with you. See, that is prophesying. God told me to tell you that he is. He was right by you when you were in a dungeon last night. He was right. You know, see, that's prophesying. God says to hold your head up. He's doing something from. See, that's prophesying. So that person comes in and they feel excited because they know that they came for the Lord and he showed up when he was when they were looking for him. That's right. That's right. So I'm telling you, yes. this is the word saying that. <laughs> so Paul says, but if an unbeliever or an inquirer comes in while everyone is prophesying, they are convicted of sin and brought unto ju under judgment by all, as the secrets of their hearts are laid bare. <laughs> that is scripture. Yeah. So they will fall down and worship God, exclaiming, God is really among you. Now I say that for this. Prophesying convicts people because there's people who, you know, y'all have come to service before and, and God has prophesied to y'all through the service because you came to the service with issues in your life and God has revealed them in the answer through the service. God has told you something that the pastor didn't know anything about. God has revealed something to you or answered a question that, that the pastor knew nothing about. And so what that tells you is God is prophesying through the pastor and talking to your situation. Has everybody been in a service and said, man, the pastor must have been in my house last night. Yeah. Man, the pastor, how did he know I was going through that? Well, I don't, but I know that the Spirit does, and the Spirit uses me. Yeah. And so that tells you that if you get that revelation, you come to the conclusion, God is here. So, Paul then gives instructions on if you're going to speak in a tongue. Because they were crazy then in speaking in tongues. They were so excited about the gift that they used it at all times. And all times wasn't the time to use it. And so Paul gave you speci gave specific instruction on speaking in a tongue. And this is what he said in verse 27 and 28. And now here's what he said. He said it then, so it should apply now. So here's what he said. Let's read verse 27 and 28. 27, he says, if anyone speaks in a tongue two or at the most three, should speak one at a time and someone must interpret. I want you to underline what it says. It says someone must interpret. 
Did you hear that? Everybody say that. Someone must interpret. Did you hear? Someone must interpret. And so, um, so what does that imply, first of all? Well, let's keep, let's keep reading. It says, someone must interpret. If there is no interpreter, the speaker should keep quiet. Now, I didn't say that. The, the word says that. But mm -hmm. uh, do, do you understand what it's saying here? It says, you should do things in order. And in order to speak in a tongue, or two, or three, it should be one person at a time. If there are two or three people who speak, not everybody should be gibbering at the same time. And not only that, but you are responsible for making sure there is somebody there to interpret what you're speaking if you cannot interpret it yourself. That's what the word says. So, so if there is no interpreter present, than no speaking in unknown languages. Ooh. Ooh. Is that knocking some of our history? Wow. It says if there's no interpreter, there's no speaking in unknown languages, and it's specifically speaking, talking about in front of the church or in the church. So that implies that the speaker is the speaker's duty. As if I come here and I know that I can speak in tongues, then my duty is to make sure there is somebody who has the gift of interpretation if I don't have it myself. It, because there's no use in me coming and speaking in a language that's a clear across the world with nobody in here who can speak that language and it's unfruitful because I can't tell you about what I'm speaking out about. So, so, so what does God say to me? What does Paul say about me? He says, if I don't have an interpreter with me, I should be quiet. Why? Because it's not fruitful to the church. Why? Because it doesn't build them up. It doesn't help y'all in any way. If I come and I can speak in that language and I look well and everybody says, wow, that's great. He can speak in that language. What is he saying? <laughs> <laughs> so this implies that it's the speaker's duty to make sure someone who is there to interpret will interpret correctly what you are saying. Now, I need you to understand this. The Old Testament uh, language that they spoke was Hebrew. So it was a Hebrew. The Jews of the New Testament spoke Greek. Right? Okay, so that's why we talk about the Old Testament written in Hebrew. The New Testament was written in Greek. Um, that's why when you hear Greek word, Hebrew word, and some of us have been confused on Greek, Hebrew, what are they talking about? Well, Old Testament is Hebrew, New Testament is Greek. So if they say the Greek word, they're talking about New Testament type stuff. So the Jews of the New Testament spoke in Greek, but when they prayed, they prayed in Hebrew. Why did they pray in Hebrew? Because that was the original word, the original word of God, the original God came through the Jews, came through the Hebrew. So when they pray, it's supposed to be holy, so their prayers were always in Hebrew, even though they spoke Greek. And so it was said to be the language of God and his people of Israel. So. Understanding tongues is understanding this. If I naturally speak Hebrew or naturally speak Greek and I pray in Hebrew and then I come uh, at Pentecost and everybody knows that I either speak Hebrew or Greek and all of a sudden I can speak in the language of these Gentiles that are around me, meaning non-Jewish people, where the separation has been for year after year after year. Why? Because we are holy and you are not. So if I can now come and I can now speak a language in all these people around me who are from different types of places who understand, who do not understand my language can understand me speaking clearly in their language that tells them that it's a work of God that has just happened to them. Because now that I understand them and they understand me. That's the whole purpose of what Jesus did when the veil was ripped in two, everything stopped, everything ended. Now everybody is entitled to the kingdom of God. So it's pretty powerful when Jews that speak Greek are now able to minister to people that speak different languages. So that's why tongues was important then, because it, it made it obvious that it was God who did a work because this person hasn't studied my language, but speaks to me clearly in my language. That's what tongues was about. So you've got to ask yourself, you know, if that's the case, and it destroyed the wall that was between Jews and Gentiles, and it destroyed all that, that border that they had in the temple and everything else. It destroyed all of that. It was a symbol uh, of God's message. 
was now open to all nations. It was a symbol that the sacrifice of Jesus was not just for the Jews, but it was for his people. He said, my sheep will hear my voice. His sheep were not just Jews because Jesus said, my sheep will not, are, are not uh, just of this sheep pen. They are of different sheep pens. Why? Because it's all nations. Everybody was invited. So if this is the case, that's why tongues were so important. Because they were able to now bridge the gap. They were able to now talk to people who were of different tongues, who spoke different languages. And so it's amazing. So it's like me being able to go over to a, a, a foreign country where I don't even understand the language and just speak freely and they hear me clearly in their language. That's, that's powerful. And that was the power in them being able to speak in tongues. So I need you to understand this. There are certain facts about speaking in tongues and you have to be careful when you think you're hearing people speak in tongues. Because whether tongue exists or not, it's not talking about it in this Bible, but you have to know in your hearts if, it's a, if it exists right now or if somebody is truly speaking in tongues when they talk to you. I want to give you some facts. The facts about speaking in tongues, uh, because this is tongues 101. And so there's a few things you have to understand what we told you earlier. They were real languages. It's one thing you have to know. They were real languages, and they were spoken for the reasons of communication, not separation. Get that? They were spoken for the reasons of communication, not separation. The purpose of tongues was to communicate with somebody. If somebody came in here and could not speak this language, now I can, because I have the gift of tongues, I can speak to them, and they'll understand the scripture. Why? Because it's all about God. It's not about myself. It's all about teaching them about what the word of God is. And I can speak to them in that tongue and they'll say, man, I understand what this person is saying. There's definitely a divine presence here. So tongues are real languages for the reason of communication, not separation. If tongues are spoken in a church, according to Paul, the speaker must have the interpreter there. If the interpreter is not there. What does it say? It says, be quiet. You, you, can, you can talk in tongues, but under your breath. Why? Because it's never about you. It's about God. And if you don't have the, if you didn't bring all your tools with you, you don't have the right to speak in tongues or what you call tongues in this church. So Paul said, uh, if the person doesn't have that, they must be quiet. And then, now it also says in public worship service, uh, well, you know, and this is the other thing, public worship service is supposed to be done, I want you to write this down. Public worship is supposed to be done to edify the hearers, not the speakers. Meaning when I come to talk to you, it's not supposed to lift me up, it's supposed to lift you up. Why? Because the word is supposed to give you clarification. The word is supposed to give you understanding. The word is supposed to change your thought process. Not about me, it's about the word of God ministering to your heart. And so um, public worship, everything is supposed to be done to edify you. You should be better when you leave here. Not, not saying the pastor is awesome, you should be saying the word was awesome. So that being the case, the need for tongues at that time was evident. So the question is, is the gift of tongues present in this age today? That's the question we ask ourselves, right? Because some of you are, are like baffled. You're like, man, I've heard people quote unquote speaking in tongues or, or, or saying these words. Anybody ever been to a place where you heard people speaking and you were confused and wondering what was going on? Or they get real loud, you get real loud. Look, I'm here to preach the gospel. I'm not here to, whether, to, to care about whether people get offended or not. I'm here to, to preach the word of God. So I, I need you to understand this. <laughs> Is the gift of tongues present in this age today? Well, if it is, it would have to fall under the scripturally correct guidelines. And these are the guidelines um, for it to be from God. It ha if it's going to be from God, it has to be according to the scripture. Paul, the, the, the word is the same yesterday, today, and forever. It doesn't change. It doesn't, it doesn't come back to you changing because of the time. It changes. It's the same thing. If Paul gave instruction, the instructions apply today. Why? Because the, time, the gifts are given today. So it's not like, well, I changed the, God tweaked the gift of knowledge, or he tweaked the gift of wisdom, or he tweaked the gift, the gift of tongues. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He does not change. So what he gave Paul is meant for you also. 
And so if this is the case, it would have to fall under these guidelines. It would have to be for the purpose of breaking the language barrier with somebody. Communicating the word of God to someone of another language in their own language. That's simple. It's not for self. It doesn't edify you. It's not supposed to edify you. It's supposed to lift up God. So if that's the case, then I can tell you just from my experience that 99% of the speaking in tongues that I have experienced have not been for those purposes. I'm not telling you for yourself. I'm telling you for what I've experienced. 99% of it have not been for those purposes. And the word says, Paul gives you specifics. The problem is we've listened to that. We've allowed that because of our lack of understanding of what Paul says. It's not what Pastor Larry says. It's what Paul says. We should go by what the word says. Scripture is scripture. So, it means that 99% of them are not scripturally correct. And if this is emphasized in your church, I mean in this church alone, if it's emphasized in this church, if it's emphasized in other churches or people listening from online, if your church is doing this, I challenge you to ask your leaders why they practice what is not in order with what the Holy Scripture says. Challenge them. Ask them. Why? Because Not because of me, but because of what you read today. Ask them why they do that. It is your duty as a child of God, if you are in a church that is different from what we're in, it is your duty to question your leaders. Ask them why they are doing what the word says opposite to. It's contrary to the word of God. Why is that? Because, look, I'm not here to win favorites. I'm here to tell people about the word of God. You want the word of God to work in your life, you have to understand what it is. Amen. So I challenge you to ask your leaders why they practice what is not in order with the, what the holy word says. God expects his children to follow his holy word, not a holy man. His holy word doesn't fail. Men do. His holy word is clear. Men aren't. His holy word is forever. Men perish. So you never follow the man. You always follow the word. And if you're in a church where the word is not being properly taught, you need to part ways. Why? Because you want to get under a church where the word is taught, where you understand, where you're always edified every week because God is talking to your heart, teaching you about things, teaching you the way and the, the, the will of God. That's what it's all about. It's not about a man getting up here in a suit. I can come up here in shorts, but if I preach the same word and it touches you and edifies you and lifts you up and changes your heart from where you were last week or yesterday, it's the word of God. Amen. Yes. Yes. Amen. So this you know, may be uncomfortable because you have had a history or you learned something from the past or you've, been, you've grown up in it. But we're not here to, 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 to push favorites on what you've grown up to and your history. God is the one who changes us. And once we become, a, it says when you come to Christ, you are a new creation. Amen. Old things pass away. Old ways are gone. And you become new. What happens? God cleanses you out and starts to replace it with the true, accurate word of God. What does that do for you? When the enemy comes, you see him walking towards Amen. you. When the enemy says something, you hear him, you know him, and you know what to say against him. And the problem is nowadays is the enemy is not on the outside. The enemy is on the inside of your church. Yes. And because we don't understand it, we let the enemy run right up to us, snag us, take all of our goods, take all of our children, take all of our household, take our money, take our, our, our houses, everything removes from us and we're looking at him and God says when the enemy comes in you have to strangle him you have to grab him you have to bind him you can't let him do what he does Amen. so I implore you to take this word and apply it to your lives if you're in a church where you're not being taught that you have just read the word of God and it confirms through Paul, not through Larry, but through Paul, how to properly speak in tongues. 
So the question that if you ask me, do people speak in tongues now? The tongue still exists. I'll say maybe it exists, but 99% of the people speaking it are not speaking in a tongue of a, of a language that, that's unknown, that's known across the world. They're not doing it. And if they're speaking in it, and they're speaking out in a service that you're at, and there's nobody interpreting it, then it's not being done correctly. What does that tell you? Then it's not of God. So we want to get you, you know, if we can at least get one of you on the right path, we're doing the work of God. Amen. Amen. So I implore you to continue to read this and study it for yourselves. If you've been blessed, I need you to stand and give God glory in the house of the Lord. Amen. Amen.